radical initiatives toward disarmament. Um, John Tierney is gone for the afternoon, so I'll probably do um, part of his section on congressional election battlegrounds because I work with a very interesting cadre of people. Um, so with that, I guess I will go ahead and get started. Teeny tiny bit about me. Um, I was the Democratic nominee for Congress in the 2008 elections. I am up here from Virginia, so I do know quite a bit about being A, in a congressional race, and I also know a whole lot about lobbying the critters that currently sit in Congress. So I spent a reasonable, more than reasonable amount of my time lobbying people at the federal level and also lobbying in my congressional district. So when we talk about the 2018 congressional election battlegrounds, we're going to be having some battlegrounds or some battles where we've got an opportunity to grab seats that if you had asked people back in 2016, did we have a prayer in hell in some of these states, people would say no, and a lot of these states would immediately get crossed off. So I'm going to be talking to you about states like South Carolina as having congressional seats in play. I'm going to talk about uh, states like Virginia. Virginia actually has two congressional seats in play. I'm going to even go way out on a limb, and I'm going to say it, Mississippi. <laughs> there, I said it, Mississippi. <laughs> We're going to talk about Florida possibly being able to pick up some more seats. Texas having a possibility to get some more Democratic seats. Arizona, we got a race that's going to be run on the 24th of Arizona. And so I'm going to add my own little weird spin on why this may be the election that most people never saw coming, especially if you're a Republican. All right, now, um, I had the privilege back in 2016 of being hired by the NAACP to be the civic engagement coordinator for the Commonwealth of Virginia. They hired coordinators in 22 states. Virginia was the only state of the 22 that they hired coordinators in where Hillary Clinton actually won. Now, one of the interesting things about Virginia is Commonwealth of Virginia has an election every year. We never tire of elections. Um, prior to last year, we also never tired of losing elections. But all that changed. Now, why did that change? And part of why that changed is why we will have the opportunity to begin to change the conversation around nuclear disarmament. That changed because in the Virginia House of Delegates, where it was 66 to 34, no, the Democrats weren't the 66, we were the 34. In our last statewide race in 2015, there were 45 seats where no Democrat ran. There's a real basic thing about elections. When you don't have a candidate, you lose. You know, it's kind of like real strange how that works out. No candidate, you automatically lost that one. So what happened in Virginia was a group of young candidates, all of them under the age of 40, 75% um, of them under the age of 35, decided to run for seats that the Democratic Party said, oh, we can't win these seats. And you know what? Out of that cadre of 19, 15 of them won. Wow. All right, now, why did they win? 
They won because the biggest bad actor in the Commonwealth of Virginia is our energy company. And they're called Dominion. Not nice energy company around the corner, they are Dominion. And Dominion has owned the governor, didn't matter whether they were Democrat or Republican, Dominion owned him. They owned our state senate, the biggest recipient of Dominion Energy funds is the Democratic minority leader, Dick Sasla. So they now refer to him as Dominion Dick or Sasla with dollar signs instead of the S's. And the biggest recipient of Dominion funds in the House side was our House minority leader. So the young people who ran that party didn't think they could win, all signed a pledge. We will not take Dominion money. So when we talk about why is there no appetite in Congress for reducing military spending or getting rid of nukes, that's kind of an easy answer. Money talks, and they're voting their money. However, as we showed the world in Virginia, money is money. It doesn't have to be votes. So one of the things that we did was a number of organizations came into Virginia and knocked on doors for the candidate that the Democratic Party didn't want. And the NAACP forgot to turn off my van access. So that meant I was free to recruit people to work the phones and call all the people the Democratic Party, labor unions, and campaigns would never think to call during an election. 30% of the population of Virginia is African American. Most African Americans have not received a call from the Democratic Party in 20 years. All right? Now, we didn't have enough people in Virginia to do the job. So I turned and I went to the people in Northern California. Northern California, those folks are not going to have a race where they are going to make a major difference in probably for decades to come. So I said, let's turn our attention to the South, to those throwaway states with all these throwaway people. And the Coalition for Underrepresented Voters was born. Now, who's an underrepresented voter? Well, communities of color. So if you're black, if you're Hispanic, if you're Asian, you're underrepresented, as in, in Congress and people paying attention to your voice in the political sphere. Now, we also get to add seniors, which is insane because seniors vote 65% of the time. And then women, and then people with disabilities. So basically, when you look at underrepresented voters, it's kind of if you're not white, you're not male, and you're not rich, you are probably underrepresented. <laughs> so what we did is we ended up building up a cohort. Originally, there were only about eh, 180 people. And we drove phone calls into all the black voters in Virginia. And we asked them to do three things. Now, this is the NAACP. We can't go near a candidate. We can't even say their name. So we called people up. We asked them to vote. We told them what offices were up. We asked them if they had the right photo ID to vote. And we asked them if they had a way to get to the polls. Well, turned out a whole bunch of them did. And those that didn't, we provided free rides. Now, next. Suddenly, there's a Senate race in Alabama. And we're like, well, gee gosh golly, Alabama has an area that they call the Black Belt. And they call it the Black Belt kind of sort of for two reasons. Number one, that is where the richest soil in the state of Alabama is. And number two, 
There's also a lot of black folks who live there because that's where a lot of the big plantations used to be and that's where people were slaves and they never left that land. So got a map, mapped out all the counties in the black belt, got the NAACP to give me the state van for Alabama and set up 125 phone banks pointed at African-American and Hispanic people in the great state of Alabama. Our team swelled to 624 people on the phone, and these people were insane. 200 dials a day from some of them. And these folks are old school. They're manual dial. They don't want no auto dialer. They want to dial the number. All right, now. 624 people later, we opened the phone bank on December 1st. The election was December 12th. 43,000 phone calls in 11 days. All right? Alabama, Doug Jones. Now, Doug Jones kind of as a member of Congress totally sucks. So we are going to need to beat Doug Jones over the head with a baseball bat on a continuing basis. We just are. I mean, the man votes for everything wrong. But we can at least say he isn't a child molester. You know, our standards are getting lower. Well, he wasn't a child molester. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll take whatever win we can get. We did Pennsylvania 17, we got Connor Lamb in, and now we are turned toward Arizona 8, where that race is going through the Hispanic community. They expect only 18,000 people are going to vote in that race. I've got 40,000 Hispanic voters in the district. So our coalition team, they are recruiting Spanish speakers to call into that district because a lot of the people we're going to be talking to are older. The younger ones, they're going to speak English. English, and their English is probably going to be better than ours. But some of the older people may be more comfortable speaking Spanish. So we are working on that. So we have swelled our coalition. There should be about 2,000 people willing to get on the phone now. By November, our goal is to have 5,000 people on the phone, making an average of 200 dials per person. Now, we do have the insane among them who will do 300 dials a day, all right? But there are many who will do 200. So with that large group of people, this is what we're looking at. We're looking at the great state of Georgia. You know, like Georgia, as in Georgia in the United States, Georgia. Yes, that Georgia. Why are we looking at the great state of Georgia? Well, because the great state of Georgia has 14 congressional seats. And if we could flip two of those seats, that could make a difference in the House in terms of voting. And they've got a Senate seat. And they've got a governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general race. And they've got 180 people in their state house. So when we added up all the seats in Georgia, there are 251 seats in Georgia up in the 2018 election. If we drive phone calls into Georgia and we turn out the black, the Hispanic, the Asian, the seniors, and the people with disabilities, we've got a shot at some seats that nobody's even looking at because the party has long ago given up. Now, our coalition members, national NAACP, um, Mi Familia Voto, Voto Latino, LULAC, Asian American Pacific Islanders Vote, and Native American Voting Rights Alliance, Social Security Works, and American Association of People with Disabilities. Yeah, we kind of got all of them. We've got a nice long list. So we're also looking at Florida. The great state of Florida, we got a Senate race. We've also got a number of House seats that we think we might be able to grab a couple of them after math. And Florida's got a ballot initiative. 
we're coming in next month starting on the ballot initiative. Florida is one of those states where felony disenfranchisement, 1.5 million people are unable to vote because of a felony in their past. They've got a ballot initiative. They're putting that out to the people. Should people with felony convictions in their past be able to vote, yes or no? A million people signed the petition. We're calling that million people, and we're going to try to add two million likely supporters on top of it to give people a reason to vote. Again, remember, we can't go near candidates, but we can grab a hold of an initiative and ask people if this is important to them. So what's beginning to happen is organizations that care about issues start getting those issues out in front of people running for office in the form of candidate pledges. Would you be willing to sign a pledge saying, if elected, you would support full nuclear disarmament? Would you be willing to sign a pledge, should you get elected, that you would support a 10, 15, 25, whatever number we as a group decide to put on it, reduction in military spending? Food and Water Watch has a pledge that they've got more than 100 candidates to sign. Would you be willing to sign a petition saying that if you are elected, you would support a full moratorium on fossil fuels by the year 2035? We get that idea out there early while they're running, as opposed to we show up and now they've been elected and everybody is going at them. And we say, this is what we'd like you to do. And we establish a relationship and we keep that relationship. In Virginia, we've got two uh, congressional seats. Barbara Comstock is gone. She's in Northern Virginia and she signed up to join the white supremacists supporting Donald Trump in Charlottesville. She's gone. Northern Virginia does not want to be associated with white nationalists and white supremacists. They're just like, nope, that is not who we are. We are busy trying to attract real businesses into this state. We don't have time for that stupidity. Barbara Comstock, go away. Um, interestingly enough, normally that seat, we would be lucky if we got two candidates to compete for it. There are nine. So a Democrat is going to win the primary, and then whoever that Democrat is, they are going to get the seat. Now, here's one that I put on a lot of maps. Virginia's 7th District, Eric Cantor's old seat, OK? Now, most people do not know what happened to Eric Cantor. Why did Eric Cantor lose his race? Eric Cantor lost his race because me and a bunch of my girlfriends realized it would be easier to knock Eric Cantor off in a primary when nobody was looking from his right than it was going to be to take it out from his left. So we borrowed a copy of the van. Somebody had a login that they forgot to delete. And we called up every Democrat that ever voted in a primary election and said, we need you to turn out and vote against Eric Cantor and vote for this guy named Dave Pratt. And we need you to bring a friend, because it's going to take all of us. If all of us and the Tea Party folks all get together, we can get rid of Eric Cantor. And we did. All right? Eric Cantor's polling told him that he was up 30 points on Dave Pratt. Well, that was when they asked Republicans. Nobody thought to go ask the Democrats. <laughs> so we have so many opportunities in Congress. Um, I expect we are going to pick up between 30 and 35 seats. We need 24 to take back the House, all right? And I think we're going to get some seats in places that we never expected to look. All right, well, my time is up on talking about that.